In today's video, we'll take a look at cases that have strange and disturbing photos associated with them. What makes the photos even more disturbing is the dark stories behind them. In the first case, we'll look at a hostage crisis that unfolded in West Germany in the late 1970s. The situation was like something out of a Black Mirror episode. The second case rocked an island in the English Channel. For nearly 14 years, the islanders were terrorized by a serial criminal known as the Beast of Jersey. Then finally, we'll look at a crime that rocked the state of Texas and shocked the rest of the world. But before we get into today's video, we want to bring you a message from our wonderful sponsor, NordVPN. I've been using NordVPN for several years and I love it. NordVPN has two aspects that I find fantastic. The first, and probably the most important aspect, is that it helps me stay safe while I'm online. NordVPN keeps my data safe behind a wall of next generation encryption. I also know my data will never be compromised with NordVPN. They have a strict no logs policy so they don't track, collect, or share your private data. The other aspect I love about NordVPN is that it opens up a whole world of entertainment. As some of you can probably tell by my accent, I live in Canada, eh? Because of that, I can access some content on streaming services like Netflix that's available in the United States, Europe, and other places around the world. But with NordVPN, I can choose from over 5,400 servers in 59 countries. So now I get access to movies and TV shows from all over the world. Just a friendly tip, if you check out the Canadian Netflix, you'll be able to watch some incredibly popular shows that were taken off American Netflix last year. For about the price of a cup of coffee every month, you can start protecting yourself today with NordVPN. Just go to nordvpn.com slash listed and use the code criminallylisted to get two years plus one additional month with a huge discount. It's risk-free with NordVPN's 30-day money-back guarantee. Stay safe online by getting NordVPN and you'll be supporting Criminally Listed in the process. Number 3. The Gladbeck Hostage Crisis Gladbeck is a town in Germany. In August 1988, it was part of West Germany. On the morning of August 16, 1988, 32-year-old Dieter Dagowski and 31-year-old Hans-Jürgen Rosna forced their way into a bank in Gladbeck. It was still early and there were no customers in the bank. But it wasn't long before the police surrounded the bank. There was a standoff and the police started to negotiate with the two men. At the end of the day, the police agreed to let the two men leave with about 227,000 US dollars in Deutschmarks and a getaway car. That night, Dugovsky and Rosna left the bank with two hostages and they got into the vehicle. After leaving the bank, they picked up Rosna's girlfriend, 34-year-old Marianne Lubesch. They drove 140 miles to the city of Bremen. Once there, they tried to hire a car, but they were unable to. So they went to the local bus station and boarded a bus with 30 passengers and took them hostage. The media descended on the bus station. Several journalists even boarded the bus where they took photos and recorded footage. They also interviewed the gunmen and several hostages. Rosna, who was still armed, got off the bus and gave an impromptu press conference on the street. Rosna said he was prepared to end it all and he even put the barrel of his gun in his mouth. But he didn't shoot himself and he got back on the bus. Not long after Dugovsky and Rosna took over the bus, they forced the driver to drive out of the station. They set off towards Hamburg, which was 75 miles away. Along with the 30 passengers, two journalists had remained on the bus. The two hostages from the bank were also on the bus. Before they got onto the Autobahn, they released four elderly hostages and a child. 
on the Autobahn, they pulled over at a service station. The two hostages from the bank were then released. Also, Rosna's girlfriend, Marianne Lobish, got off to use the washroom. As she was exiting the washroom, the police grabbed her. When Nagovsky and Rosna realized that Lobish wasn't returning to the bus, they gave the police an ultimatum. They would have to release Lobish, or they would execute a hostage every five minutes. The police didn't release her, so Dugovsky shot 15-year-old Emmanuel E. de Georgie three times in the head. Emmanuel E. was on the bus with his little sister, and she witnessed the shooting. Several witnesses said that the intended victim was his sister, and Emmanuel E. jumped in the way to save her. Emmanuel E. was dragged off the bus by the two journalists. He was rushed to the hospital but he died not long after arriving. After Emmanuel E. was shot, Lobish was released and she returned to the bus. The police had tried to release Lobish before the five minute deadline, but they had a problem with the handcuffs because the keys were broken. The bus set off again with police cars following it. As they drove, one police car collided with a truck killing a police officer and injuring another. On August 18th at 2.30 a.m., the bus entered the Netherlands. The police in the Netherlands surrounded the bus. They refused to negotiate with Dugovsky and Rosna if there were children on the bus. So, at around 5 a.m., they released three women and two children. Several hours later, the German police provided Dugovsky, Rosna, and Lobish with a BMW. The trio and two hostages, Silka Bischoff and Enis Watal, who were both 18, piled into the car. Bischoff was a trainee at a lawyer's office. On the day she was taken hostage, she had finished work and she had waited for an hour to take the bus with her friend, Enis Watal. Rosna and Lobish got into the front seat, and Nagovsky, Bischoff, and Vital got into the back seat. At first, it appeared that they were heading to Amsterdam, and then they turned back and re-entered West Germany at about 7 a.m. It had been nearly 48 hours since Nagovsky and Rosna robbed the bank. To keep themselves going, they had been drinking beer and using amphetamines. After returning to West Germany, they drove to Cologne and parked outside of a shopping district. They were surrounded by dozens of journalists and onlookers. Several journalists interviewed Silke Bischoff as she sat in the car. The behavior of some journalists was utterly unethical. One of them noticed that Dugovsky's gun was on his lap. The reporter suggested putting the gun to Bischoff's head to make their footage more dramatic. A journalist in Cologne named Udo Rebel had not been working for the past two days and he had not been watching TV or listening to the radio. So he only heard about the hostage drama that morning. Rebel went to the shopping district and pushed his way through the crowd. He managed to strike up a rapport with the trio of hostage takers. It was clear that they were starting to unravel mentally from the lack of sleep and the drugs and the alcohol. Rosna asked Rabol for directions to the Autobahn, but Rosna had a hard time remembering the instructions. So he asked Rabol to get into the car and direct him. Rabol agreed, and he got in the back seat next to Silka Bischoff. The Rosna pulled away from the crowd and drove towards the Autobahn. They got on the Autobahn and they started driving towards the city of Bonn. About 45 minutes after Rabol got into the car, Rosna pulled into a service station and Rabol got out. Then Rosna, Dugowski and Lobish and their two hostages got back onto the Autobahn. 
Two hours later, the police rammed their car, leaving it immobile. This led to a shootout between the police and the gunmen. It ended with Rosna Dugovsky and Lobich being arrested. Rosna was shot in the thigh. 18-year-old Ines Vital was shot, but only received a minor wound. She had managed to get into a ditch, and she survived the shootout. 18-year-old Sika Bischoff was not as lucky. She had been shot once in the heart, and she died as a result of her wound. There are conflicting reports about who shot her, but the police said it was either Rosna or Dugovsky. The entire ordeal lasted 54 hours, and the trio traveled over 430 miles, and three lives were lost. In March 1991, Theodor Dugovsky, Hans-Jürgen Rosna, and Marion Lepush were all sentenced for their roles in the deadly crime spree. Both Dugovsky and Rosna were given life sentences. Lepish was given nine years in prison. She ended up serving six years, and she was released. Dieter Dugovsky was released in August 2018 after serving 30 years in prison. Upon his release, he was given a new identity, and he now lives in anonymity. If he is still alive at the time of this video, he's 65 years old. Hans Jürgen Rosna is still in prison, and it's not known when or if he'll be released. He is 64 years old at the time of this video. The police and the media were heavily criticized for their handling of the crisis. Number 2. The Beast of Jersey Jersey is an island in the English Channel not far from the northwest coast of France. At 45 square miles, the popular vacation spot is the largest of the Channel Islands. In the 1950s, Jersey was home to about 50,000 people. A horrifying crime spree began there in November 1957. A 29-year-old female nurse was waiting for the bus. She was attacked by a man with a face covering who dragged her out into a nearby field where she was raped. The woman went to the hospital afterward and she received several stitches, but she survived. Several months later, in March 1958, a 20-year-old woman was walking home after getting off a bus. A man came up to her and put a noose around her neck. She was dragged into a field and raped. She was released and she reported the attack to the police. In July 1958, August 1959, and October 1959, there were remarkably similar attacks. However, in the October 1959 attack, the 31-year-old woman was able to fight off her attacker. The victims all had similar descriptions of the attacker. He had a slight build, he was about 5'6", and he had a mustache. He was possibly in his early to mid-40s. He had an Irish accent. Finally, he had an unusual scent that many described as musty. Perhaps the attacker was emboldened by his failure because he started to commit more daring crimes. Early on Valentine's Day 1960, he broke into a home and he put a noose around a 12-year-old boy's neck. He led him outside and he raped him. In March 1960, a 25-year-old woman was walking to a bus stop. A man who claimed to be a doctor offered her a ride. She accepted and got into his car. He drove her out to a field where he beat her with his fist and then dragged her out of the car. In the field, he sexually assaulted her. He then forced her to get back into the car and he started driving. At some point, she managed to get out of the car and she started screaming for help. 
the rapist sped off. He committed one of his most notorious crimes in March 1960. A 43-year-old woman and her 15-year-old daughter were living in an isolated house. He cut their phone line and broke into their home. The woman heard someone in her home, so she went downstairs to investigate the noise. The man grabbed her and demanded any money she had. Unfortunately, the noise drew the 15-year-old girl out of bed and she came downstairs to see what was going on. This distracted the rapist and the woman ran from the house, leaving behind her daughter. The woman went to a neighboring farm, but no one was home. The woman ventured back home and discovered that her daughter had been attacked. A noose had been placed around her neck and she had been led out to a field where she was raped. All the victims said that the attacker was a man with an Irish accent and he had a musty smell. At this point, the residents of Jersey were in a panic and they demanded action. It wasn't long before a person of interest emerged. It was a 45-year-old eccentric man named Alphonse Logastawa. Logastawa lived alone in a rundown cottage. He was often seen walking around the island by himself. When Logastawa was asked what he was doing on his walks, he said he just enjoyed nature. Logastawa was interrogated by the police and he denied committing the attacks. The police found no evidence to connect him to the crime spree, so he wasn't arrested. In April 1960, a 14-year-old girl was asleep in her bedroom. When she woke up, she saw a man wearing a mask in her room. She screamed and the man ran away. A few months later, on July 30th, an 8-year-old boy was abducted from his home. The kidnapper was wearing a unique raincoat. The boy was sexually assaulted and brought back home. It's believed that the rapist stopped attacking people for the rest of 1960. Then on February 18, 1961, a 12-year-old boy was kidnapped from his home. He was let out of his home by a noose, but supposedly he wasn't sexually assaulted and he was returned home. Weeks later, on March 4th, a 11-year-old boy was awoken by a man strangling him with a belt. The boy managed to scream and the man ran away. In April 1961, an 11-year-old girl was kidnapped from her bed and raped in a field. At this point, the attacker had garnered a name, the Beast of Jersey. Many people still believe that Alphonse Legastawa was the rapist. But the police had searched his home a dozen times and found nothing. Legastawa was harassed by the islanders and vandals ransacked his home. Legastawa maintained that he was innocent. In May 1961, Legastawa exiled himself on a small island called Les Acreo which is about six miles northeast of Jersey. He reasoned that if he was away from Jersey and the attacks continued, it would prove he wasn't the beast of Jersey. Around the same time that Legasawa left the island, Scotland Yard became involved in the investigation. But their help did not lead to an arrest. For a year, there weren't any attacks. Then on April 19, 1962, a nine-year-old boy was abducted from his bed. He was raped in a field and then allowed to return home. The boy described his attacker by saying he was wearing a long overcoat and he had a musty smell. Then once again, the Beast of Jersey went quiet. It's believed that he struck again in April 1963 when he kidnapped and sexually assaulted a nine-year-old boy. 
Several months later, in November, an 11-year-old boy was attacked. Nearly half a year later, in July 1964, a 10-year-old girl was sexually assaulted. A month later, a 16-year-old boy was assaulted. The victim said he was wearing a long overcoat, a horrifying mask, and a wig of black hair. Scotland Yard started to collect fingerprints from people on the island. Eventually, they would collect prints from over 20,000 people, but they still didn't arrest anyone. It would be two years before there was another attack. In August 1966, a 15-year-old boy was raped by a masked man. Then, once again, the Beast of Jersey took a hiatus. Then in August 1970, a 13-year-old boy was kidnapped by a man wearing a mask, a wig, and a long coat. Like many of the other victims, he was taken to a field and sexually assaulted. Then again, there was a long stretch without an attack. On July 10, 1971, a police officer attempted to pull over a car that had run a red light. The driver didn't pull over and he led the officer on a high-speed chase. He eventually turned onto a road that happened to be a dead end. The driver stopped, got out of the car, and ran. The officer gave chase and eventually tackled him. The man was identified as 46-year-old Edward Paynow. The officer noted that he was wearing wristbands that had nails sticking out of them. Also, his long overcoat had lapels with nails coming out of them. Edward's car was searched and the officer found some suspicious items. This included a belt with a knife sheath, a flashlight, and several lengths of cord. But the most damning items were a mask and a black-haired wig. Edward Paynow was brought to the police station for questioning. Edward was a well-respected man on the island. He was a construction worker and his wife, Joan, ran an orphanage. Edward and Joan had three biological children and they had fostered several children. At the orphanage, Edward was known as Uncle Ted and he would dress up as Santa Claus every Christmas and hand out toys and candy. Edward was questioned and he was asked where he was going when he ran the red light. He said he had been on his way to an orgy. Edward continued to be interrogated and finally he admitted that he was the Beast of Jersey. The police searched his house and they discovered a secret room hidden behind a cupboard in his home office. The investigators immediately noted that the room had a musty smell. In the room was an altar and above the altar was a dagger pointing down towards a glass bowl. There was also a chalice full of cloves. There were several books on witchcraft and black magic. There was also a book about Gilles de Ray. De Ray was a knight who fought alongside Joan of Arc in the 15th century. After retiring from the military, it's believed that he engaged in a horrifying series of child murders. According to several historical accounts, his victim count is in the hundreds. After Edward was arrested, many photos were taken of his mask wig and coat. Sometimes officers would model them and other times they were on mannequins. It was never clear why he wore the mask other than to hide his identity. Some people believe he wore it for his own belief in black magic. Other people think he did it to terrify his victims. Edward Paynow went to trial in November 1971. Although suspected that he committed dozens of kidnappings and rapes, he was only facing 13 charges from 6 attacks. 
During the trial, it was revealed that Edward believed that he was a descendant of Gilles de Ray. The trial lasted five days and the jury deliberated for 45 minutes. Edward Paynell was found guilty on all counts and he was sentenced to 30 years of prison. Edward's wife, Joan, claimed she never knew about her husband's crimes. They apparently hadn't slept in the same bed for years. She slept in the master bedroom and he slept in his home office which had the entrance to the hidden room. In 1972, Joan published a book about Edward called The Beast of Jersey. Joan and Edward eventually got divorced. In prison, Edward started a relationship with a woman. They got married in 1989 while he was still in prison. Edward Paynell served his entire 30-year sentence. He was apparently an ideal inmate. He was released in 1991 and he returned to Jersey. But for obvious reasons, people were deeply upset that he'd moved back to the island that he had terrorized for 14 years. So he and his wife moved to the Isle of Wright. Edward Paynell died three years after he was released from prison in 1994. He was in his late 60s. Number 1. The Luby's Cafeteria Massacre This photo may just look like an auto accident. Accidents like this do happen from time to time. For example, a driver intends to park, but instead of hitting the brake, they put their foot on the gas pedal and drive into a storefront. But the story behind this photo is much more tragic. George Renard was born in Pennsylvania in October 1956. His father was an army surgeon and his mother was a homemaker. Renard had a tumultuous relationship with his parents. His father was described as tyrannical. His mother was an attractive woman who dressed younger than her years. Hennard initially craved his mother's attention, but that would change as he got older. His parents would argue often, and sometimes the fights turned physical. Hennard's family moved around a dozen times before he graduated from high school. Hennard never made any close friends, and he was a mediocre student. His favorite pastime was smoking marijuana and listening to rock music. He also played the drums, and he was in several bands. But he never lasted long in the bands. After graduating from high school in La Cruz's New Mexico in 1974, Hennard enlisted in the Navy. He served for two years, and then he was honorably discharged. He then joined the Merchant Marines. It was during this time that people noticed that Hernard had a horrifying mean streak. He was always angry, and he was extremely misogynistic. In 1989, after 15 years with the Merchant Marines, Hernard was fired. He was fired because a small amount of marijuana had been found in his cabin. By all accounts, this was an incredibly dark time in George Hennard's life. After losing his job as a merchant marine, he worked menial jobs but never stayed in one position very long. Hennard rarely dated. Instead, he preferred having sex with sex workers. It was well known that Hernard hated women, but the woman he hated the most was his mother. His relationship with her was volatile, and he often referred to her as a viper. In June 1991, Hernard paid a visit to the FBI. He claimed that a cabal of women was ruining his life. He said that they were spying on him and listening to his phone calls. He also said that they were talking to potential employers so he couldn't get a job. 
A few weeks later, Hernard moved into his mother's mansion in Belton, Texas to be the caretaker. His mother wasn't living there and she was planning on selling it. During this time, Hennard repeatedly watched documentaries about mass murders. One mass murder he was obsessed with was the San Adistro McDonald's Massacre. In July 1984, 41-year-old James Huberty shot 21 people to death and wounded 19 more in a McDonald's in San Adistro, California. His rampage came to an end when he was shot by a police sniper. At the time, it was the deadliest mass shooting by a lone gunman in American history. Hennard had even visited the site of the shooting. Hennard also became obsessed with the song Don't Take Me Alive by rock band Steely Dan. The song is about a killer who is holed up with a case of dynamite and the police have him surrounded but the killer refuses to surrender. Hennard would listen to the song over and over again. On October 15, 1991, George Hennard celebrated his 35th birthday. He drank most of the day alone. The next morning, Hennard went to a local convenience store and bought breakfast. Hennard did this most days, but the store clerk noted that he was in a good mood for a change. He went home, and on a calendar, he wrote, Life has become a stalemate. There's simply no hope and not a prayer. At 11.50 that morning, Hernard got into his pickup truck outside of his mother's home in Belton, Texas. He was armed with two semi automatic handguns and more than 100 rounds of ammunition. Both guns and the ammo have been legally purchased. He drove to nearby Killeen, Texas. In Killeen was a Luby's Cafeteria. Luby's Cafeteria is a chain of cafeteria-style restaurants that are mostly located in Texas. October 16, 1993 was Boss's Day, so Luby's was busier than usual. That day, there were about 150 people in the diner for lunch. At 12.39 p.m., 35-year-old George Renard drove his pickup truck through the plate glass window at the front of the restaurant. Renard then started shooting from inside his truck. He then stepped out of his truck and started shouting something to the effect of, This is what Belton did to me. Is it worth it? This is payback day. He then started shooting at both employees and patrons. He targeted women, but men were shot as well. One thing Hernard didn't do was target children. He even shouted, tell people I ain't killing no babies today. He shot many of his victims in the head to ensure that they died. The police were called and several officers arrived within minutes. A shootout between Hernard and the police ensued. Hennard was shot in the right forearm. The bullet went through his arm and ended up in his chest. He was then shot in one of his thighs. Hennard managed to get into a washroom. He put an end to the rampage by shooting himself in the right temple. He died on the washroom floor. The entire rampage lasted about 12 minutes. 22 people, 8 men and 14 women died in the restaurant. Another woman died in the hospital. The victims ranged in age from 29 to 75. At least 20 other people were injured. With 23 people dead, Hennard set a new macabre record for most murders committed by a lone gunman in American history. His deplorable record would stand for 16 years until the Virginia Tech shooting in April 2007. Other than being an angry man, no one is sure why George Hennard committed the mass murder. 
Nor does anyone know why he chose the Luby's cafeteria in Killeen to commit the massacre. Often, in the wake of mass shootings, people advocate for changes to gun laws. In contemporary times, there are usually calls for stricter gun laws. The Luby's Cafeteria Massacre was different. A 32-year-old woman named Susanna Hub was in the restaurant having lunch with her parents, 71-year-old Al and 67-year-old Ursula Gracia. Hub survived the shooting, but both of her parents were killed. That day, Hub had a gun, but she kept it in her vehicle because bringing it into the restaurant was against the law. After the shooting, Hub became an advocate for a person's right to carry a concealed weapon. In 1996, largely thanks to Hub, it became legal to carry a concealed weapon in some places in Texas. That same year, Hub ran as a Republican to be a state representative, and she won. She served five terms, and then she retired in 2007. The Luby's cafeteria reopened five months after the shooting. It remained open until September 2000 when it closed for business reasons. The building is now home to a Chinese food buffet. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Don't forget to check out the special offer from NordVPN. Protect yourself by getting NordVPN today. Also, please check out the latest episode of our podcast, Into the Killing. In our latest episode, we look at one of the most famous cases of the kids on the milk cartons, Aton Pates. It's a strange case with lots of twists and turns. You can find Into the Killing on Spotify, Google Podcasts, and Apple Podcasts. Well, that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.